we got Ken Davis here. Um, hello, Ken. And uh, you're, you're in uh, New York right now, right? I am in my office in New York City, which is, of course, very excited today because we have a parade. Yeah. Oh, right, 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 right. It's a good one. <laughs> uh, we uh, just uh, uh, celebrated our U.S. women's national team with a parade down the Canyon of Heroes, the second time in four years for them. So um, the city's been very excited about that, and that's been wonderful here. Um, first, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for this opportunity, uh, and also thank you for the promotion to professor. I am not a professor. Um, and nor am I a doctor, although an, an honorary one. So no, I'm just a, a scribbler. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, I'm, you know, preaching very much to the choir here. So I've learned as much uh, in the last few minutes from listening in as, and the Alan Taylor book in particular, I'm very eager to get my hands on. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'll just make a few general comments because I think, as I said, I'm, uh, you, individually and collectively probably know a lot more about this subject than I do. Um, what I try and focus always on is how do we make this story meaningful to the end user, the students in our classrooms. And my approach to that has always been to try and make it more human, first of all, and you've already been talking about that, and then also make sure Sure that we do make the connection between past and present. Um, my, uh, my antenna went up a few minutes ago when you were talking about, uh, I don't know, recreations or, uh, you know, something like that. And simulation. I just... Simulation. The simulation. The, the notion that, and I see it, I saw it recently here in Westchester, in uh, Bronxville, New York. Um, a teacher who did another one of these, you know, uh, thinking that it was this would be a fun way to teach about slavery, S having a slave auction class. No, don't don't go there. And uh, so th it seems like that message has slowly but surely gotten through. But um, uh, there's so much territory to cover here. I'm not sure where I want to begin, except I'm going to begin with an experience I just had last week. Um, the great fortune, of course, you, you guys are in the midst of the place of it all. And I was in Boston recently, and it was great to walk the Freedom Trail and, and to go to uh, Old South and, and see this place and see Joseph Warren's words there. Uh, it's, it's tremendously exciting to me. And uh, I'm a big a proponent of the field trip approach to history. So Again, I, I have a feeling I'm preaching to the choir here. But this past week, I went to, uh, my wife and I went to the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. Like most New Yorkers, we hadn't been in a long, long time. But it was really an extraordinary experience. And we don't necessarily think about the connection to Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty being one of a connection to the revolution. But to me, the trip underscored two things in our history. Um, one is that the Statue of Liberty, uh, as you probably all know, was dedicated to the idea of abolition and emancipation, not to the idea of immigration. Uh, Lady Liberty has chains at her feet. Uh, those chains are the chains of the enslaved that were broken after the Civil War. Um, a lot of people didn't know that. They just opened up a wonderful new museum on Liberty Island that tells that story in very um, succinct and fitting fashion, that this is liberty enlightening the world. So we're never too far away from the question of slavery when we look at American history. I underscore that point with people all the time. The second part of the trip, of course, was to Ellis Island, where we got some information on my wife's um, grandparents, who she grew up knowing, but they never really talked about Italy, and they didn't speak Italian. Um, 
now we are learning Italian and, and regretting even more that we didn't know all this stuff. So this idea of immigration and slavery are two of the central themes that I've focused more and more on in my work in recent years because they are so much a part of what we are going through as a nation right now. And of course, when you talk about the revolution, you cannot talk about it without discussing slavery and the role of African Americans in the revolution. And you cannot uh, not talk about immigration. Uh, I was recent, uh, uh, you know my book, In the Shadow of Liberty. I'm, I'm glad someone held it up. You may not know my uh, earlier book, which is called The Hidden History of America at War, in which I tried to just take six central key battles in American history and address um, what they meant. And the first one in it is, is Yorktown. And I remember coming across a quote, probably finding it in Ray Raphael's book. And I'm, I'm sorry, I missed uh, Ray's video. I'll catch up to it some other time. Ray Raphael, certainly um, the person who I read a long time ago and had influence on me. But I think I came across this quote in Ray Raphael's book. Uh, it's by a French officer in 1781, and he says, I cannot insist too strongly on how I was surprised by the American army. It is truly incredible that troops almost naked, poorly paid, and composed of old men and children and Negroes should behave so well on the march and under fire. Um, that was written a few weeks, of, actually a few months before Yorktown, and I, I focused on Yorktown in this book um, because of my feeling that uh, people have heard, heard about Bunker Hill and they, they've heard about Lexington and Concord a little bit. Maybe they know about Saratoga, but we only know the story of what happens in the end at Yorktown and not the buildup to it. And so most people certainly do not know the story of Washington demanding the return of the property held by the garrison. Uh, that property of, co of course was five to 6,000 African Americans, we don't know the exact number, who had escaped to the British in hopes of gaining their freedom. Uh, what has been called the greatest slave escape in American history. Um, Simon Shama's uh, wonderful book, Rough Crossings, certainly dealt with this. Uh, I, I imagine that the new Taylor book will. So we can't talk about American history in any aspect without talking about this aspect of slavery and its role in the revolution. And that is essentially the reason writing the book about Yorktown was really what to write in the shadow of liberty, the hidden history of slavery for presidents and five black lives. I have been talking and writing for nearly 30 years about slavery and this incredible contradiction that this nation conceived in liberty was also born in chains. But still people don't understand that or they don't want to recognize it. It is part of that history that we have brushed under the carpet, although done a much better job in the last 10 years in particular uh, in, t in talking about it. But I have been writing about this idea for a long time. How do these men who profess these ideas, all men are created equal, mm -hmm. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, how do these men then go back to plantations utterly dependent upon enslaved labor? It is the mo one of the most fundamental questions in our history and one of the, the ones that leads to almost the rest of uh, American history, so we can't avoid it. For a long Long time I had written about it in terms of what Jefferson and Washington and Madison had said, written, done in relationship to slavery. And what I wanted to do in this book is turn the tables and bring the narrative around to the voices of five of those people who were enslaved by Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Andrew Jackson. Um, and I did that at, uh, by fortunately being able to find that most of them had left uh, there was a paper trail for most of them, and in some cases, they had actually told their stories to others, as you probably all know. So this is a uh, is a, a story and a subject that I am passionate about, and I also find that when I talk to kids about it, and I talk to a lot of kids, um, they're fascinated by this idea 
and they want to know. They are curious. They don't, they want to try and understand this, and I don't have all the answers for them, but I think that's okay too. We can't always have all the answers, but if we ask the right questions and get them to ask the right questions, we're on the right trail as historians and as teachers. Um, so that's kind of what I've been trying to do in my focus on looking at the, the whole prism of, uh, looking at the whole story of America through the prism of these major themes. But then when you look at them through these major themes, you must come back to the human beings who are at the heart of the story. And I think that's, um, you know, from my perspective, a very effective way of, of reaching younger people in particular. Um, and when you get to tell them that, you know, if they were 14 in, uh, in 1776 or 16, they could have very well been in George Washington's Continental Army. Um, their ears perk up because we think about the men who fought for Washington, but they were, they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I always also try and emphasize in talking about history to students is how important in American history mm -hmm very young people have been in almost every movement in our history. I had this conversation the other day, it was just around the 4th of July, I was on a radio show and we were talking about not just the uh, signers of the declaration, but some of the founders. Hamilton is, you know, 18 when he joins the army. Marquis de Lafayette is 19 when he comes to the United States. The soldiers like Joseph Plum Martin are teenagers when he enlists in the army. Um, I think when you bring those human stories around and see these people not as a face on the $20 bill, but a, a, an 18 year old college student who leaves college to join Washington's army, that's what makes it real and meaningful to students. And that's what I'm low, always looking for when I'm looking for stories to grasp the imagination and catch up, catch the fire with these kids. And I would say in the last, uh, oh, since I'm gonna say 2011, I started doing this around the 150th anniversary, the beginning of the Civil War. I started doing Skypes into classrooms. I've probably done three or 400 of them by now uh, over the past uh, six or seven years. and. And this is obviously part of a much bigger conversation about how we teach history and how much time we spend teaching history, which is a crucial issue right now. And one I'm thinking and talking about a great deal. So I've talked more than I wanted to. And uh, what I would love to do is um, answer any questions you. I, I, I have a question for you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, sometimes, um, Students, when they hear we're going to talk about uh, underrepresented voices, if you will, um, or we're going to hear about ordinary soldiers, you know, uh, Joseph Plum Martin, or, um, or we're going to hear about some um, uh, a woman uh, up in uh, Maine, uh, you know, uh, uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's book on, on uh, Martha Ballard uh, in her post-revolutionary experience. Uh, they say, well, you know, all right, that person wasn't very famous. They didn't really do anything important. Why are we spending time on this, they say. Why are we, why are we wasting time on these other people? Because we really want to know about Jefferson and Washington and Adams. What do you say to, what do you say to that? Um, and I'm sort of posing a question that I think some of our students really do come into the classroom with. That's interesting because in my talking to students, I've never had anybody raise that question with me. And I suppose the answer is there are lots of ways to talk about history. And certainly we can talk about the famous people and the trick about talking about the famous people that I've tried to do is balance out the scales of history. That's certainly what I tried to do in, in The Shadow of Liberty. Uh, for most of 200 years, George Washington was presented as the marble statue demigod uh, you know, the, the statue of him in the toga even, uh, a Greek god who could do no wrong. And obviously that is not who he was. Uh, he was a human being with flaws, failures, contradictions, uh, made mistakes and did remarkable things in spite of that. And so 
it's not like I think we should talk about Deborah Sampson, who was apparently back in the news recently. I, I, I haven't followed up on it yet, but I saw a new piece about Deborah Sampson in the New York Times the other day. Um, to, uh, to talk about the average person who participated in history is to make history, I think, flesh and blood. Um, my father didn't, uh, didn't win World War II like George, General Eisenhower did, but he went to North Africa and Italy. And to me, uh, I wish I had had his story. We, he was one of those guys who didn't talk about what happened uh, during World War II to us. We knew he was there, we knew it meant a lot to him, but we didn't really know what happened. So um, I think that bringing that human side of the story is crucial to getting people and especially kids to realize that history isn't something that just happens in books to famous people. History is about what real people do in real places all the time. And not everybody is the president. Not all the decisions are made by the kings. And Washington couldn't have done anything without these teenagers and African Americans and immigrants, um, people who couldn't speak English uh, were fighting in his army. And uh, thank goodness he had uh, some foreign generals who were able to talk to them. So I think that that's you know always the trick is is turning the turning the question a little bit and, and saying, well these. These are the real people who actually did the hard work, who marched, who starved, who had to stop and bake bread or forage for uh, pigs in the, in the woods to feed themselves. And to me, that's, that's real history too. And in a way, I always feel like if you get that excitement and human side of the story, all the dates and battles and speeches will follow and make more sense afterwards. Right. Well said, well said, thank you for that. Can I ask kind of a follow-up question for, from the very beginning of your book, um, The Shadow of Liberty, um, you, you uh, make a distinction about uh, terms and you say, look, I'm gonna talk about uh, people here, uh, your five principal characters, and you've actually got more than five that you tell us the story of, which is great, between slave and enslaved person. And um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of giving you sort of the, the, the line that I, you might hear in the hallway as students say, oh, come on, how politically correct. Can't we just talk about who they were? They were slaves. What do you say to that? It's a really good and a really important question that I never thought about for most of the past 30 years. And then I had a very smart child, very uh, good school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And she started to talk to me about the distinction. She was a history and literature. I'm talking about my daughter. She went to Harvard as a history and lit major. Um, and she was the one who really raised this question with me while she was still an uh, undergraduate. So at that time, and I'm talking about 10, 15 years ago at least, um, this was an academic question that was being used in academia and hadn't made its way into the, uh, the general conversation. I think that raising my consciousness about the very specific difference of calling someone a slave, which identifies that person in a certain way and saying they were enslaved, in other words, they were acted upon by an outside force, is a, is a distinction with a tremendous difference. And I think that I've been able to explain that to kids and they understand. I know I, uh, because I'm of a certain age, I slip back very easily and say slave very often. It's a, a struggle for me to make sure I say enslaved. So it is politically correct, but I think it's historically accurate. And that's more important to me than dismissing something as political correctness. Um, I think that language is really important, just as we're struggling with, as a nation with what to call the people who were here when Columbus arrived. Um, the, the idea that we identify people who were victims of a, a crime against humanity called slavery doesn't mean that they were slaves. It means that they were caught 
in a system and they were enslaved by other people. And those other people included some of the most famous, powerful men in our history. And I think when you make that distinction to kids, and obviously it depends on what age we're talking about. I usually speak to middle school and high school age students. I, I don't find that there's uh, too much pushback on that. Thank you. If I could speak to that just a little bit as well, I mean, because I'm in a different situation as a national park ranger, but still an educator. Um, one of the things that we talk about as I try to make better use of the term enslaved person is also the idea that there was more to these people's lives and their being and their identity than that status of being enslaved. That they had, they had, while it shaped them, they had a family life, they had work, they had skills, they had desires that weren't defined totally by being slaves. And I ask people, uh, you know, what do you do? Are you a student? Do you have any life outside of being a student? Uh, do you want to be just defined by being a student or being, a, being just solely being a teacher or anything? I find that that, that also connects to people what, what Gorman and, and others were talking about, historical empathy. Mm -hmm. There seems to uh, seems also to affect their I, understanding. I agree completely. Beyond the the legalism of it is the idea that to say that someone was a slave is a as a rather small box to put someone in. So yes, um, so uh, you know Isaac Ranger Jefferson was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson, but he was a tinsmith and a father and he. Uh, told his story and he experienced extraordinary things and he was in Yorktown when General Washington was bombarding the British and talked about it afterwards and said that uh, General Washington took him back to Master Jefferson who was mighty happy to see his people. So that's uh, a person talking. That's not just someone who's uh, uh, given this uh, somewhat impersonal label of slave. Thomas Jefferson's slave. No, Isaac Granger Jefferson was uh, um, much more than that simple word. And that's what uh, I think saying enslaved person starts to get at, that this is uh, a, a designation that um, means more than you were a piece of property, which slave is, uh, certainly implies. Uh, Ken, can I ask a question about, this is great, by the way. Um, last week, the school board in San Francisco voted to cover over the George Washington murals. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that since the subject you've been discussing. Uh, yes, I, I was actually on the radio with, uh, with a radio station in San Francisco, and, and it was just around the time. I think they've decided since that was the 4th of July, I think, or the 3rd of July, I think they've decided in, since then that they are going to paint over it, uh, a decision which, which I d do not agree. I don't see that these murals have the same uh, resonance or impact as a statue of a Confederate general in the center of town. Um, the murals are, were, uh, you obviously all know the story, I would imagine, the murals were painted by a leftist, perhaps communist, in the 1930s, and they depicted some of the things that we're talking about here. George Washington as slave owner, uh, slave holder, and slaver. Uh, the treatment of Native Americans as uh, uh, and oppressed people. Um, that's a part of our history that we should be shining a light on, certainly not painting over. And this is where I get into uh, the, as sympathetic as I am to many things that are derided as p politically correct, this is where I get into the idea that as teachers, we have an obligation to explain the hard history. And, uh, um, so I think that the idea that you just, just the hard history 
is not the solution to the problem. So I'm, I'm, I regret that they apparently made the decision to uh, cover the murals up rather than make them not just a teaching moment, but a, a, a lesson uh, for everyone who sees them. Um, so th that's unfortunate. I, I, was, I was hesitant to bring this up, but it, it raises this whole question of historical memory. I was recently in Italy and flew into Marconi Airport. Um, I think you have a Marconi uh, site out there on Cape Cod. Wealthy. Wealthy, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was doing some research for a new book and discovered, which I had never read before, that Marconi was a fascist. Mm -hmm. um, Marconi uh, went to Paris in 1919 as part of the official delegation after World War I, and he was asking Woodrow Wilson specifically to return a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that the Italians considered part of Italy. Wilson apparently gave in the bum's rush, and that was it. Mus uh, Marconi goes back to Mussolini's Italy and becomes joins the fascist party soon afterwards. Um, Mussolini was actually Marconi's best man at his second wedding. Also rather remarkable. There were pictures of them on a boat together. I found a quote of um, uh, Marconi saying, just as I found a way to bundle together radio waves, uh, uh, Mussolini has found a way to bundle together the energy of, of Italian politics. And this was all shocking to me to some degree, um, and but specifically because I had flown into Marconi Airport and when I discuss this with Italians, they either don't know it at all or don't really want to discuss it um, because uh, uh, while we're having a vigorous and healthy for the most part debate about what to do with memorials, I don't think they're quite uh, sure what to do about somebody like Marconi uh, and his uh, affiliation with Mussolini and fascism. Uh, so this is a, another whole fascinating yeah separate side, which is historical memory, not only in America, but around the world. And um, uh, I went to uh, the, uh, there was a small uh, camp outside of the uh, smallish town of Modena, which is the camp where Jews were taken before they were deported to Auschwitz. And it's the camp where Primo Levi, uh, the Italian writer, was taken before he was taken to Auschwitz. And um, because many Italians have never heard of it, they've never seen it. There's also a wonderful, I should have it right here, uh, a museum nearby. It's called the Museum to the, the Deported in the town of Carpi. Um, really a fabulous uh, museum and very much off the beaten track. Uh, but this is so important to continue to talk about Keeping, preserving historical memory, preserving the truth, being unstintingly involved in telling the truth. Uh, and it's more important, obviously, now than ever before when we are in this age of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a struggle every day. Um, just reading the news is a struggle every day, for me at least. And uh, I just think that we have to remain uh, truth tellers uh, as historians and as teachers. Thank you. I think in addition to, to that conversation is, is, to me, when I, when I speak with students, I, I, I try to have them think about the, ter the presentation of statues and memorials and, and historic sites. Um, you know, just even thinking about, you know, the, the whole controversy over the Confederate statues in, in the South and, um, you know, what to do with those. And, you know, it, to me, I, I always question, you know, like, how do you, you know, what, what were the statues intended for and, and how should we look at, um, statues and, and memorials, you know, is it to glorify this or is it to learn something from it? So I, I don't know, it's, it's just something that I keep in mind and, and thinking about, um, you know, having those conversations with my students about, you know, how do you look at, at 
um, statues, murals, sites, um, and and I don't know, maybe maybe it's a crude thinking, <laughs> but I don't know what what do you do you feel like you know it's it's whether to preserve to, to is to to learn from it or is it, it was it intended for for glorification of a particular event or or I don't know. It's a really good and really important question. And the whole Confederate monument has been a great learning, again, a great learning opportunity for all of us. Um, I think that a great many people obviously did not know when, for instance, most of these Confederate statues went up, uh, not only across the South, but in other parts of, of the country. And the vast majority of them went up in two distinct periods in the 1920s. Uh, the 1920s being a period when the Ku Klux Klan came back into extraordinary power, not just in the southern states, but across the country. Very powerful Ku Klux Klan movement in the 1920s, partly as a reaction to World War I uh, and uh, the hatred of foreigners, because we think of the Klan primarily as being racist in, uh, in a racial sense, but they, of course, opposed uh, foreigners, Catholics, and Jews as vociferously as they, uh, they wanted uh, racial purity. Um, so it's really important, I think, to say those statues were put up for a very specific reason in the 1920s by a group of people who had a very specific political agenda. The next great wave of construction of those statues was in the 1940s and 50s as a reaction to uh, uh, desegregation and the civil rights movement and the expression of states' rights as a code word for white supremacy. So um, in the case of the Civil War statues and the Civil War generals, I think the, the answer is very clear. It's been a great way to talk about what those statues were designed for. Um, here in New York, we had a statue in Central Park, I think it was, dedicated to a doctor who was um, grabbing a little bit here for, uh, was involved in uh, treatment of syphilis uh, and, and made some groundbreaking uh, discoveries. Only later was it revealed that he had done this at the expense of primarily of African-American women that he experimented on. So his statue has been removed and, you know, as a New Yorker, I'm kind of glad to see it because now we've heard the story. Um, so this is, uh, I, th I think all of these are again come back to these, these learning opportunities. And there's such a distinct difference between a statue to a Confederate general like Nathan Bedford Forrest, a founder of the Ku Klux Klan, that might have been put up in the 1920s by the Ku Klux Klan, and a painting of George Washington by a leftist during the Great Depression. Um, so these are these are perfect opportunities to talk about what what history is like at a at a particular moment, and how we see history and how we view history. Um, the Statue of Liberty, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is another perfect example of this. And this new museum explaining the roots of the Statue of Liberty being a, a monument to the liberation of the African Americans after the Civil War is a shocker to most people who are making that trip out there and thinking about their grandparents coming here and how she was a symbol of the welcome they received, which is another story entirely once they arrived here. So I, I'm really glad that we're having these conversations and they've provided uh, a lot of historians a great opportunity to say, what the real story is. And that's always, again, that's what we have to be. That's what we have to be truth tellers and say, you can have this very nice picture of uh, the way it used to be, but that's not the way it used to be. But this seems, this seems to me, it points to the purpose in many ways of your whole, a lot of your work don't know much about. Um, and that is what are the uses of history or in all the other things, geography that you have in, in, your, uh, in your series, um, the uses of history in the present, the uses of history in the past, the uses of historical memory and how we bring it back, uh, 
when we think about the American Revolution. I know uh, Bob Allison, for example, is at the forefront of Revolution 250 in, in Massachusetts. And uh, how do we commemorate that? What do we, what do we look at? How is that different from the commemoration uh, uh, 50 years ago, which ignited me as a, somebody interested in history uh, during the bicentennial? How do you see the uses of history in the present? And it, we, could you encapsulate that in some way? Because I, I think you've, you've been really at the forefront of that with your, with your Don't Know Much About series. I never think of myself as the forefront of anything, but <laughs> but thank you for that. I, I I suppose, you know, I I guess I've I started writing history because I loved history and I couldn't understand why anybody said it was boring. Um, it was never boring to me. Uh, talk about going to places. Um, I still have my souvenir of the trip to Gettysburg in 1963 uh, when I was nine years old. Uh, it was a wooden revolver or with the dates of the battle stamped on it. When I was nine years old and I stood there in those fields and I didn't understand uh, you know, the issues of the Civil War, but I knew something extraordinary had happened in that place. And I believe that that has a lot to do with my loving history, along with the fact that my um, veteran father got um, some army surplus sleeping bags and tents and threw us in the back of the car and we'd go off to places like Gettysburg and Valley Forge and Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York, um, where from a very young age, I had the sense that history is not something that happens books. It happens to real people in real places. I, and that's why I say I'm a big proponent of the, the field trip approach to history. I know well, the teachers think, oh my God, we have to get bus permission slips and the, the kids go wild and brown bags. But I think that, that seeing these places and touching these places and smelling these places is what makes history real and meaningful to kids um, in a very different sense. My wife and I were at, on the Mayflower reconstruction several years ago, quite a while ago, and she was chewing some gum and two little sixth graders, I think, were standing next to us. And one of them said, gee, I didn't know the pilgrims had gum. He obviously could smell her gum. And so, you know, maybe that's the impression of those take away from going to the Mayflower, that the, the pilgrims chewed gum, but um, he smelled something. And, and I think that's, that's the real point. So all of these experiences of going to places, of reading about real people, I think cement for students the sense that history is, is a living, breathing thing, not, not just a, a date to memorize for the test on Friday and then forget. And sometimes the lesson may not be clear right away, but it certainly always will be there and may come back. Um, I'm impressed, you know, recently uh, I, I, I watched these kids down in Parkland after this terrible event and the way they came together and started this rather extraordinary movement speaking about how children are often young people are often the leaders in in some of these social movements in our country they turned this terrible tragedy into a meaningful campaign to change gun laws and somebody said you know someone rather snarkily said and I'm sure it was someone on one of the conservative uh, network said, where do these kids get these ideas? And one of them said, well, we got these ideas because we went to history class. Um, so this country has some really good ideas. It was founded on some really good ideas. Uh, I'm a great believer in those ideas. I know when I talk on the 4th of July and I talk about you know, the contradiction of the American foundation and the fact that 41 of the 56 signers were slaveholders or involved in the slave trade, but they were also pledging their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor to this. And that's not just pretty poetry. If they had been caught, they might've been strung up on the spot or perhaps shipped back to London for a show trial. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was certainly pursued in 1781 uh, by a British army that was carrying silver handcuffs uh, to uh, take him back to London. Um, and I usually uh, put the exclamation point on that by saying the man who was carrying the 
handcuffs was probably Benedict Arnold, um, which is the way that history extraordinary real people uh, and no no fiction writer could write a better story than Benedict Arnold tracking down Thomas Jefferson in 1781 uh, in, in uh, revolutionary Virginia so all of these stories I think and humanizing these stories uh, are to me the real flesh and blood connection point for kids and I, I do think that Many, not all of them, many, not, not all of them will come away. Now, I very often go in and start a, a school presentation in an auditorium with 200 or 300 kids, and I'll ask them outright, who likes history? Who thinks it's boring? And, you know, half of them like history, half, more than half don't like it. They think it's boring. But by the end of the hour where I've talked to them about either In the Shadow of Liberty or my more recent book, More Deadly War, about the Spanish flu and, and the First World War. Um, they're all asking questions. They're curious. They're excited. They're interesting. All of a sudden, history isn't just the stuff that they, they read in a textbook. And um, I, I think that one of our real important jobs is to say, this is really important. This has to get off the back burner. It's not even on the back burner in a lot of schools. It's not even on the stove we have to put this front and center because this is who we are. We have a crisis in democracy in America and around the world. And the only way we're going to fix that crisis is by getting people engaged in history. And through history, they will become more civically engaged. And that's part of my crusade right now as a, as a writer, as a historian, as an American. Yeah, so um, kind of segueing to this, um, you recently um, wrote an article, I think, um, for social education that I think will be coming out um, this fall, um, focusing on the role of social studies and how that would be, how that should safeguard democracy. I thought maybe you would like to talk a little bit about, you know, like do a little teaser for, for the article that you that you've uh, written for uh, Social Education Magazine. Yeah, it's, it's scheduled for the September issue. Uh, uh, I'm told it will be the, leads, uh, the lead story in the issue. The title of the article is Democracy is Not a Spectator Sport, The Role of Social Studies in Safeguarding Our Democracy. Um, this was the subject of a, a, a seminar, a webinar I did uh, on Zoom with uh, the National Council for the Social Studies uh, a few months ago. And in fact, I'm going down to the NCA Leadership Collaborative next Monday to talk about this as well. Um, Tina Hafner, who is the incoming president, well, I guess it's July, she is now the president of NCSS. And I had a conversation last December at the NCSS conference and we, she heard me talk to a teacher who asked, how do I answer the kid who says history doesn't matter? And I talked about why history matters. And she said, wow, you, that's such an important subject because this is our Sputnik moment. And I said, wow, wow, that's a great way to put it. Um, this is a Sputnik moment. We uh, have this emergency uh, that we have dreadfully uh, hurt ourselves by the way we've mistaught history. And this isn't a new story, but it's a very old one. The Woodrow Wilson Foundation recently talked about it and said this goes back a century. So it's not like this happened weeks ago or two years ago. But certainly it's gotten worse in the era of No Child Left Behind and Common Core. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that um, you know that story very well and I don't have to go into it. So. We have that problem, first of all, the problem of how we teach history, how much time we spend on history, plus this incredible problem of social media uh, that you know, kids are getting a lot more of their information from Instagram and YouTube and the host of other platforms than they are from classrooms. And teachers I know have to deal with the question of, do I let the kids have their phones in the classroom? I, it's an astonishing idea to me, but I'm very old fashioned. Um, so there's a tremendous uh, need for the conversation 
about what's gone wrong and now what do we do about it. Um, everyone I read and write and, and have written about and read about talking about this says we need more civics education. And I agree completely. We have to spend a lot more time talking about American history and civics and geography and economics than we have been. And the dirty little secret, and I'm sure most of you would agree, is that um, reading history is a, if you read good history, is a great way to teach reading. You don't have to read fiction to learn how to read. You can read nonfiction and read history and become really good readers who ask good questions and find sources. All of those things that we want students to, to become. So um, certainly the question is how to spend more time teaching history, how to do a better job of teaching it, um, how to teach civics and history from K through 12, not in you know one semester or one year of, uh, of high school. Um, these are really big questions that I feel are at the, at the root of why we are disengaged as a nation. I mean, even in a good year, a good presidential election, we get to about, what, 62% uh, uh, turnout. That's just not good enough. And uh, we're seeing the risks of that. And I don't mean just in the past two years. Uh, Freedom House, which monitors democracy around the world, says the United States has declined in democracy for more than eight years. Uh, they've seen a decline of, of democracy, of course, around the world for, for most of the last 20 years. Uh, so this is a big issue about how we safeguard democracy at home and abroad, and it's clearly not uh, a priority of the current administration, um, but I think as concerned human beings, teachers, historians, citizens, we should be very much concerned about it. And that's what the article is, uh, is going to address. Um, people think that, like the Washington Post says, that democracy dies in darkness. I argue that it does not. It dies in broad daylight. Uh, Mussolini and Hitler did not need darkness. They were elected officials who got put in charge of government by men who thought they could control them and very quickly uh, democracy vanished in Italy and then Germany. Uh, it, it dies quickly, it vanishes overnight, it usually vanishes with uh, large cheering crowds that are willing uh, to go along with these ideas. And so history teaches us that, and that is one of the lessons that I feel we have to keep talking about and thumping the drum about. So I, I wonder as a follow up to that and to bring us um, to connect in back to the American Revolution, there's um, an argument that's been made by a number of people that the revolution, uh, and Bob Allison was talking earlier today about the state constitutions. I'm thinking particularly about the Pennsylvania state constitution you were talking about earlier, uh, Bob, uh, that the uh, American Revolution went too far. That in fact, um, it, it, it uh, unleashed democracy um, in a way that was uncontrollable. Um, and uh, what we really needed was a, uh, a more, more of an uh, elite to bring things back to order. And that was what the Constitutional Convention was all about. Um, and in fact, it was a, a notion of retrenchment, if you will. Um, and I wonder if that less, uh, whether you buy that argument or not, um, would resonate with today. And what, what, what do you think of that? And I, I, I open that up uh, to you, at, you know, what you just said, in the light of what you just said about what's going on today. It's a great and important question. And uh, of course, and I've written about it at, at length, and I bring it out in this piece that will be in the Social Studies magazine. Um, our framers in particular, were not great champions of democracy. They, uh, they saw what uh, a mob could do in Western Massachusetts, and that's one of the reasons they decided to get together in Philadelphia, isn't it? Uh, when uh, Daniel Shays and his, uh, many of them veterans, uh, decided that uh, this um, republic uh, was not what they, exactly what they had gone to fight in the revolution for. Uh, 
Um, certainly that's, that gets at the heart of the revolution being, you know, whose revolution was it? And which, which story, you know, which point of view do we tell it from? Um, certainly the uh, slaveholder in Virginia uh, had very different views of the American Revolution than the mechanic in Boston. Uh, so that's part of the story I think we have to tell. I am of the uh, opinion that for all their genius uh, in framing the Constitution and trying to limit democracy, uh, the founders and the framers specifically um, were incredibly short-sighted. Um, the idea that they left, first of all, half of the population out uh, was uh, a grievous problem. The fact that they did not consider African Americans, enslaved African Americans, uh, citizens, or in Dred Scott, the Dred Scott decision, you know, any more than a, a piece of property, uh, is is part of the history as well. So, in two hundred years. If you look at all the amendments to the Constitution and start to narrow them down, a good many of them have had to do with expanding democracy rather than limiting it. And so we went from the, uh, not including the enslaved to including the emancipated African American male. Then we went to including the, uh, the women. Then we went to including those folks in Washington, D.C., who really had no vote. Uh, and we also switched the uh, election of the Senate to the popular vote, as opposed to the state legislature. Um, the very ennobled idea of the elite, which comes out of you know, the notion of ancient Rome in a way, and this, uh, this highly idealized, romanticized vision of Rome as this uh, idealized republic, uh, just doesn't bear up to reality. And I think 200 years has shown we are, we have taken many, many steps to increase democracy. Uh, certainly not what many of the founders or framers would have had in mind, but they also would have said, well, we had the notion that we should leave this constitution in, in such a way that you could change it as time went by. And obviously it has been changed. Uh, I'm in favor of more democracy rather than less. I think obviously the democracy should be uh, an educated, informed democracy. And that's a, a very, very different question because that's at the heart of the whole uh, media, social media, uh, internet uh, question that we're facing as a society. But no, I, I I don't hold the view that um, the, the Republic was meant to be uh, governed by a, a group of well-off men who had the education and the experience to make the right decisions for the rest of us. I think it comes with democracy, there needs to be the notion of civic virtue, right? And civic responsibility. It's, it's not it's not a democracy where people just think for themselves, <laughs> right? I mean, democracy, I think, is, is, works when, when we think about what's in the best interest of the common people and the common good, right? Well, of course, and that's, and that's what the prologue to the Constitution tells us, isn't it? That we, the people, in, in order to make a more perfect union, and, the, the, uh, you know, so this is, you know, this is at the heart of, of who we are as a country. I mean, I'd also say that we also have a system ideally intended as a system of checks and balances so that the worst potential for the tyranny of the majority uh, is uh, that a pure uh, democracy might create will be regulated by the legislature on one hand and then the courts on the other hand. Uh, what is democracy? A great uh, piece uh, in the movies in the past, a documentary in the last few years, um, Cornell West makes the point very early on that um, if it had been up to uh, just a democratic vote in 1954, there would be no Brown versus Board of Education. But the courts have always fulfilled that role of protecting and guaranteeing 
the rights of the major the minority from the tyranny tyranny of the majority. So I, I think that's you know you have to see it as part of a, a, a whole system and not just the matter of what the majority decides. I mean you can tell kids in class, yeah, we're going to vote for whether we'll have um, chocolate or vanilla ice cream and, and the majority will rule. Um, but it doesn't say that um, if you voted for chocolate ice cream, you can't have any if vanilla wins. Um, that's a very different thing. Uh, so I, th I think you can always make clear to, um, to kids that uh, it is a democracy, but that doesn't just mean that um, the majority rules here. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, so for anyone else who's uh, here, is, do you have any questions for, or any issues like to raise or, or talk? Uh, I'm gonna duck out then, Gorman. Uh, I, I've enjoyed this colloquy very much. <laughs> thank you for inviting me in. Thanks for having me in and, and uh, thanks for doing what you do. And maybe I'll see some of you in October. Yes. So, uh, yeah, Ken, um, I've, I've invited Ken to come to uh, the, uh, our fall conference. Great. Uh, Arbor in October, October 25th. Um, he is going to be our morning keynote. Um, um, so yeah, I, I look forward to, to seeing you then and uh, I'll be talking to you very shortly in between. Okay, I think we might very well be talking about this question of democracy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Talk to you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I guess that kind of concludes our, our session for today and um, I thought it was a really good session. Um, I think it, it's yeah I like it so far it's good doing all right um, so um, again on the chat um, there is a, a link um, and I'll, I'll send this email to all the teacher participants about next week's um, session we'll be here again around 10 10 o'clock Wednesday uh, would be July 17th and the focus would be with women and children and um, the, uh, there's um, reading assignments um, that's on the page. And also, if you get a chance, uh, be sure to uh, watch the conversation with Ray Raphael. Uh, the link is there. Um, again, it's on a private YouTube channel. Um, and that's, that conversation was really just as good as this conversation, uh, especially with Ken. But uh, before we uh, conclude, uh, Bob and, and Charlie, what what would you say would be maybe a, a big takeaway from from our conversation with Ray, or even uh, with our conversation with Ken? Well, I think this has been great. So I really commend you for putting this together. <laughs> I, I I would agree. I think it's it, it's terrific, um, and I'm glad that you brought up Gorman uh, the concept of civic virtue. Uh, toward the end, um, I mean, what we're about, a lot of our participants are likely to be uh, teachers in Massachusetts, um, and being aware of civics is ever more important with the new framework, um, and what does it mean to be an educated citizen, and how do we see the revolution uh, as a, um, uh, a way to access citizenry? Uh, a lot of what we talked about last year is, is, is terrific. So I was inspired by... Uh, by listening to uh, uh, Kenneth Davis and um, excited uh, to hear uh, Bob give us a lot more rich detail as always and look forward to uh, hearing more from Merrill uh, about uh, the National Park and things that uh, you, you're doing there Merrill and and from uh, all the teacher participants and, and the participants period um, in the group so look forward to more people chiming in as we go along so thanks Gorman. Great thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams, is there anything you'd like to add or, or um, say some parting words before uh, we uh, conclude? No, I'm all good. It was really interesting. Sorry, I just was off away from my computer for a moment. Oh, okay. Thank you, guys. It was really good. Thank you. All right, awesome.
All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day, and um, I will uh, see you all next week. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.